Hello, everybody, and welcome to another week of Water Talks. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is the second part of a two-part series. We began um, just two weeks ago, since we're doing Water Talks every two weeks now. We'll be looking at InfoWorks ICM again, just going over some of the basics and, and how InfoWorks ICM is a very comprehensive tool uh, for folks to get started with. So again, thank you for joining, and um, we'll jump on in. All right, so your host today, again, everybody from uh, the Autodesk side are your host today. Uh, myself, my name is Tim Medeiros. I've been with Innovise for coming up on six years now, which is crazy to think about, but I'm calling in from uh, just north of Denver, Colorado. I've spent my time here at Innovise, kind of half the time uh, doing technical services and support uh, work trainings all around the country, all around the world, in fact, and the latter half of my six years doing uh, technical demos, talking with customers, uh, and seeing, making sure our solutions meet uh, customers' needs. But uh, I'm happy to be joined by a, a relatively new hire to Innovise, uh, Midori Patterson. Midori, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yeah. Um, so as Tim mentioned, um, my name is Midori Patterson. I joined Autodesk a couple months ago um, at this point, and um, I'm a water resource engineer by trade. Spent the last few years working on hydraulic um, H and H modeling for floodplain studies um, and master drainage plans. Have some experience in stormwater design and modeling as well. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited to be uh, have joined the Innovise team at Autodesk. And um, yeah, excited to be hosting my first water talk. I've been a big fan of them for a while, so it's fun to be on the other side. Perfect. And we're we're lucky to have you here, and very you know interested. I'm sure there are a lot of folks on on the listening here today that are interested to hear your perspective on things ICM and how it relates to things you've done in the past. So looking forward to that and, and, and more water talks from me in the future. Great to have you. All right, so again, just a couple notes uh, for folks that maybe this is your first water talk you've kind of jumped into, but we've been doing this for the last couple of years now uh, as a part of kind of creating the Innovise and now Autodesk community uh, where you can kind of come and get your questions answered as they relate to uh, different hydraulic modeling topics uh, related to Innovise software. So unlike kind of standard webinars, we like to focus on your questions. So please do put those in the uh, Q&A down at the bottom of Zoom. Uh, whenever they come up, you don't have to wait till the end. Uh, please do put those questions in the Q&A option in Zoom and not in the chat. Uh, it's harder for us to keep track of the questions and make sure we get to everybody if the, the chat is kind of crowding up. So leave the Q&A uh, for questions and the chat for internal discussion amongst attendees. Got quite a few of you here today. Um, but yeah, we will be solely kind of going through questions uh, in that Q&A panel there. Uh, in terms of upcoming water talks uh, and webinars, uh, again, these will be every other week and normally on Tuesdays, except for the next one, uh, which will be on the 1st of June there on a Wednesday. Uh, we'll be pivoting from uh, kind of storm sanitary and flood modeling within Infox ICM and moving towards our asset management platform within uh, the SAS Info360 application to look at uh, some of the new tools and functionalities that the development team has been hard at work on there. Uh, and then two weeks from then on the 14th, uh, we'll be again pivoting to distribution modeling, so clean water modeling uh, within InfoWater Pro and we'll be we have a guest speaker from Ohm Advisors up in Michigan who will be joining us to talk about their approach to emergency response planning and it'll show some Esri dashboarding and how they integrated that with InfoWater Pro in that one. Uh, and then after that, we'll be looking at some new functionality again within primarily InfoWater Pro will be the Autodesk product um, and uh, looking at unidirectional flushing uh, in there, which is a module that again is available within all uh, subscriptions of InfoWater Pro uh, at this point and moving forward there. All right, and again, uh, maybe you can put this in the chat, Midori, if anyone ends up uh, looking in there, we will be recording uh, this presentation and distributing it to all uh, registrants if you happen to need to log off early, but we appreciate having you here. And again, look forward to uh, any questions you might have. All right, with that housekeeping out of the way, um, again, our topic for today uh, is InfoWorks ICM and primarily taking a, a, a new look, I guess, at the um, 
what's now available as subscriptions under the Autodesk kind of subscription model. So uh, previously, you know, with Innovise, there were all these different ways of purchasing in Forks ICM, different linkages and 2D, 1D, uh, all these kinds of different packages. Now we've simplified it. There's either ICM standard or ICM ultimate. And uh, Infoworks, ICM, and both of these, I guess I should say, are available again as yearly subscriptions. So um, we want to kind of take a fresh look at these uh, because you know we, there might be some folks out there that, that are new to these uh, products uh, and, and want to understand kind of what they're all about and how to get started. So in this webinar today, we'll really be focused on Infoworks ICM standard. So the uh, maybe more approachable uh, version of Infoworx ICM. Uh, everything you'll be seeing today in the webinar, uh, fully able to do with um, that package. Uh, and, and primarily we'll be looking at kind of 1D simulations today. So there's a lot of things Infoworx ICM can do. We've done a lot of webinars on, again, the uh, kind of best in class capabilities of Infoworx ICM when it comes to 2D modeling and time series data. And uh, again, the database management, how accessible that it is. Um, if you're looking for some of those advanced topics, we have lots of recordings for you on, on how uh, ICM you know, can do that work today though. We're really gonna focus on kind of those new users and specifically kind of 1D simulations, dry weather flows, capacity analysis, sanitary sewer overflow uh, modeling and things like that. Start with the basics for folks here, okay? So just a little note on that. And again, the reason we're doing this is because of, again, there's been some repackaging and rebranding and ICM as a whole as a platform, I think is a lot more approachable from um, frankly, a cost standpoint now more so than it has been in the past. Uh, but one of the things we wanna highlight is again, we're ICM is more approachable from a cost standpoint, which makes you know this best in class tool uh, for so many consultants and utilities that we've experienced all everything on the left is you know what we've heard directly from customers in terms of how ICM is their preferred tool for all things sanitary storm flood modeling. Uh, we want to take that uh, to, to, to more folks out there, as well as recognizing that there are areas for improvement for us as uh, Innovise and now Autodesk for how we can uh, support users with the software. We've heard from folks that, um, you know, say, yeah, it's, that's great that you have all these tools and functionality and that ICM has the best database, the best engine, the most capabilities uh, for doing that type of modeling, but uh, it, it's a little too much for maybe what I need or it, it looks too complicated. So again, that's part of why we're here doing this webinar series so that uh, hopefully we, we hope to hear uh, and what we have already heard from our our webinar two weeks ago is that, uh, you know, now with this more accessible, uh, more approachable tool in Infoworx ICM, I'm able to do more with my capacity analysis and, and be able to model my, um, and, and kind of get ahead of sanitary sewer overflows in a more proactive way, uh, in ways that my, uh, my approach before with other software, or other tools wasn't able to. Uh, and, and kind of this understanding that yes, there are lots of functionality within Infoworx ICM. It is a very comprehensive platform, uh, but just like you don't know all the buttons in Microsoft Word, and you don't need to know every um, macro that's used in Excel, you can still use that tool uh, to get the job done kind of thing. So hoping to show that same exact thing with Infoworx ICM through uh, webinars and, and trainings like this here today. All right. So again, just to reemphasize this, there are a lot of things that Infoworx ICM can do. 1D, 2D hydraulics, INI hydrology, rain, uh, can look at different rain gauges, can bring in even radar information, can um, kind of be this library to store swim models, HECRAS models, uh, all these different things, open channel flow. Uh, there's tons of different things we can talk about in terms of Infoworx ICM, groundwater modeling even. Uh, but for today, again, just what we've seen with a lot of utilities, the use cases, hey, I need to know, uh, is my network today uh, gonna have the capacity for uh, you know, significant rainfall events, for significant uh, RDII flow, for uh, significant dry weather flow of my uh, utility, my kind of municipality is expanding quite rapidly. Uh, that's what we're really gonna be focused on today. So again, if you're looking for 
uh, advanced SQL queries or the best way to mesh uh, tips, tips for, you know, good meshing or something like that. There's plenty of other webinars for you. Please put in the survey at the end what your specific area of interest is, and, and we'll be sure to reach out after this. But for today, very basic kind of 1D analysis. And kind of on that note as well, for anybody out there, again, I, I talked to somebody yesterday who I think was attending today from Dallas, just looking to learn a little bit more about Infox ICM. We do have resources for you. Um, and some of these are new. The uh, Innovise Learning Center is available on our website. Uh, and it's a new uh, kind of place you can go where you can access some of these very quick uh, tutorials. We've got over seven hours of ICM specific training on here. And again, it's all accessible from our website. Going to Learning Center right here, logging in with your kind of Innovise account and um, getting to that there. So just wanted to point that out. That was something we didn't quite get to two weeks ago. Um, but with that, I think it's time to pick up where we left off from two weeks ago. Ryan and Hunter had done a great job kind of creating the model and we'll be looking at uh, some of the simulations and, and what we can do uh, with the model from here. So with that, I will stop my sharing and pass it over to you, Midori. Thank you, Ryan, uh, or <laughs> Ryan, thanks, Tim. Um, let me share my screen here. Okay, yeah, so kind of like Tim mentioned, um, we're gonna be going over, kind of picking up where Ryan and Hunter left off last week, so this should look familiar. Um, to recap, last, or not last week, but during the last um, demonstration, Brian and Hunter brought in all of these network elements from GIS files. Um, they had used the inference tool to kind of fix the missing data, loaded in these subcatchments, added some runoff parameters to them, um, and created a uh, standard rainfall run. Um, today, we're, or kind of the, I'm going to go over some results, but I'm actually going to create just a dry weather run. Um, and so I'll open up this run group here, update this to my latest version. And as you can see, kind of the only difference between um, what Hunter and Ryan set up last week is this rainfall event for the dry weather fellow. I don't have that rainfall event. Um, and I kind of just wanted to highlight, you know, this run window can look a little intimidating. There's a ton of different options and, um, you know, ICM is an incredibly comprehensive tool. You can make it as detailed, as intricate as you would like, but for a basic dry weather flow scenario run, all you really need is, you know, you need your InfoWorks network, you need a wastewater demand um, curve, and then you just need some time information about, about your model. And that's, and that's really it. Um, again, yeah, so it's, it's a pretty, pretty, easy to kind of just set up something basic. Um, so I am gonna go ahead and run this model um, and then we'll kind of dive into how to make sense of those results. And so you can see in my job control that that is running. Um, and kind of something else while that's finishing up that I'll just point out, um, InfoWorks is nicely laid out in terms of being able to kind of group different InfoWorks objects together. Um, over in the left side of my screen here, you can see that we have these groups for our SQL queries, groups for selection sets, all these different things. Um, so it's pretty easy to maintain good model hygiene, keep things organized. Um, and so now that this dry weather flow event has finished, uh, we're going to just drag it onto our geo plan here. Um, and right now, nothing really looks different. You can see that this little uh, date and time window popped up, which is uh, corresponding just to different times within our uh, simulation. Um, and there's kind of three main ways that you can start looking at results. You can create themes that will change the results within this geo plan. Um, you can open up graphs and you can look at tables. And I like to start with looking at the themes just because I think it's a good way to apply something to your entire system 
um, <clears throat> get a good graphical representation of what areas might need um, might need a little more focus. So to create a theme, um, you would just right click on your geo plan, go to properties and themes, and this window will come up and you can start to edit the properties, the display properties of all of these different kinds of objects. Um, and once you've edited these objects, um, you would then save it and it'll, you can save to a database object. And so that's what these items are here. So I've already created these themes um, and to apply a theme to a model result, you just drag it onto, um, you can drag it onto your geo plan. So um, <clears throat> obviously when someone's running a sanitary sewer analysis, um, something that is of interest is those overflows. And so kind of throughout um, these results, I we're gonna focus on um, some pipe surcharging and um, manhole freeboard. So I've dragged the pipe surging theme, surcharging theme onto here, and we'll go ahead and take a look at what we had, um, kind of what, what this is showing us here. So since this is a pipe surcharging, it's going to be controlled by the conduit uh, object type. Um, and we'll look in to this. We have this surcharge sub theme that we've set up. Um, given it a name of surcharge. And uh, we've chosen this simulation surcharge state parameter to um, as what we're changing the display of. You can see there's tons of stuff that you can do. Anything with this sim uh, prefix means that it's a result, um, like a simulation result. And so we have that pulled up. And um, this is a really nice metric because it can kind of really help you hone in on um, the real, the true bottlenecks of your system. So we have this set up so that a uh, value of a surcharge state value of less than one is green, one is yellow, two is red. And what these correspond to are, if it's less than one, your D over D is less than one, you don't have a full pipe. If it's at one, your pipe is surcharging on depth. And if it's at two, your pipe is surcharging on flow. So there's actual head on those pipes. Um, and this is useful because, you know, sometimes if you have a pipe running full, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna have a problem in that area. But once it kind of starts um, being surcharged by flow, that's when you can kind of really start to focus in on um, where your problem areas might be. And I kind of want to just mention again, um, Ryan talked about this a lot during the last demonstration, but at any time, if you just press F1, um, the, so, oops, where'd it go? The support window will pop up. And I definitely had to use this kind of to learn more about these surcharge states. Um, and, you know, there's just kind of at your fingertips, all of this documentation um, you can just search for anything. And so if you wanted to read more about kind of what these surcharge states mean, there's lots of information within this help file. So just definitely want to make another plug for that. Okay, and so as we can see, we have that loaded. I've dragged it on. Um, another really useful tool is this show maxima value. And so if you click this, it will um, show the maximum surcharge state at any time in the model. You can see that time step window kind of went away. Um, and that's just because this is showing the maximum values and not the model at a specific time. Um, another theme that I have set up is this node freeboard theme. And so I'll drag this onto here. And now you can see that the display of this has changed a little bit. Um, our nodes are now color coded based on the free board at each of these nodes. And I want to talk about this theme a little bit because um, this is a pretty neat feature as well. You can also create these um, sub themes based on SQL expressions. So this SQL button here allows you to create these expressions and edit them. You can see that this one was built just looking at the simulated flood depth. Um, the some manhole parameters and just kind of measures the differences between those to get a value of um, freeboard at that node. So a negative freeboard value means that your 
HDL is above your manhole elevation and that's kind of where you're going to start to experience some flooding. Um, and so that's kind of how those property themes work. Um, if we kind of like toggle back and forth between these, you kind of see that like this branch here might be having getting close to having some issues. Um, and so we'll kind of focus in on this branch here. And a good way to kind of uh, separate an area of interest from the rest of your network is to create a selection set. And so I have these other selection lists already created. If you drag them onto the plan, you'll see that they will become selected. Um, and so I want to make a new one just for this section. Uh, and we'll want to name it um, something that is useful is in if you right click and go to this GIS layer control, you can load these web map service layers. Um, and so you can just you'll enter in the URL here. And this is obviously helpful to um, contextualize your network a little bit. Um, this is going to take a couple seconds to load. But you can see that now this map is loaded. Um, it might be hard for you guys to see because I have some transparency added to this layer, but this street is Queen Street. So we'll just go ahead and call this the Queen Street branch. Um, and I can create the selection set just by clicking on the different links, holding down control, and that allows you to select multiple elements. Um, another useful tool that a lot of our customers really like are these trace tools. So you can trace upstream or trace downstream. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and use this trace upstream tool. And it, I selected on this link and it selected all the pipes upstream of it. I actually don't want to look at these pipes. So if I go back to my select tool, hold control again, and just click on these to deselect them, I now have um, this selection set that I can save to a InfoWorks object. So I want to save it in the selection street group selection list group, call it Queen Street Branch. And you can also um, create these selection sets based on SQL queries, um, which again is useful in kind of automating some of your processes. Um, <clears throat> all right, so now that we've kind of gone over the uh, themes that you can apply, we will look at the different graphs that InfoWorks has available. So if you go to results, go to graph reports. Um, there's these three kind of preset reporting tools that you can use. Simulation summary gives you results based on like overall model results. Simulation reporting allows you to compare different simulations on the same graph. Um, but since we're just looking at the dry weather flow right now, we'll look at the location report, which allows you to show the results of different locations. Um, at different locations. So for example, like the different pipes that are in this selection set. So we'll go ahead and click on simulation report or location report, sorry. And I have the dry weather flow simulation added in here. I have the current selection list loaded. If I didn't have this already selected, you can just drag these over here. And um, InfoWorks is kind of visual, which is uh, really nice for beginners, especially um, when you bring it over, it'll kind of like these boxes will turn green if you're loading the correct type of thing and it won't let you drag things that you're not supposed to drag. So it's just kind of a cute little tool um, and makes things really visual and easy to learn. So now I think we can look at node results. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and create a graph of the flow press OK. And as you can see, the different or the flow values within the different pipes are all plotted on the same graph. And this is really easy to export to CSV using this export traces button. Um, and then you can just title your CSV and export things that way, which can be useful for customizing your results further or sharing those results with other stakeholders. Um, another good graph report tool is um, these custom graphs. You can 
kind of make anything that you want, but one that I really want to focus on is this observed versus predicted data. Obviously for your model calibration, you need to, you'll have, uh, you might have some field survey, um, and then you want to compare what's actually going on in your system to what the model is predicting. So this, um, I have this Bucky field data flow survey group loaded. Um, I just have depth in here for the sake of this exercise. But again, just drag in that flow survey, drag in the predicted data, the simulation that we want to compare it to. And when we dragged that in, uh, ICM read this file, saw that it was a depth file. Um, and then we dragged in the predicted data. Since we're just, since we just have a depth file in here, um, we don't need to look at the flow and the velocity. And ICM automatically kind of mapped these locations. So it noticed that I had these links, these link names within my predicted data or within my observed data, which matched these link names in my predicted data. Um, and then I'll click on this graph button and it will show the observed, <clears throat> observed data in green uh, compared to the field data in red here. And so this is really useful model calibration and also just kind of identifying areas where you might need to um, make some model improvements, um, you know, where your observed flows are higher than your max day flows. You might be having some unwanted INI issues when you're, uh, or like in, conversely, if you have your observed data less than your predicted models, you might have some leakage issues, um, or it might just be a model, a matter of model calibration and um, yeah, you can start to kind of tweak some of your inputs to get these to match up a little better. Um, I'm not gonna save this. Um, and yeah, kind of the final major way that you can look at the results is just in a table. So um, these grid result or these grid buttons will open up tables, any grid button that has the small blue Um, play sign indicates like a model result. So I'm going to drag the Queen Street branch selection set on here again, since that's kind of what we're focusing on. I'll click on the link results grid, and you can see that this is showing all of the results for every single pipe that's in the system. Since I have the Queen Street branch selected, that's what's selected here. Um, if I just wanted to look at what I have selected within the table, if you just hold down control and then click the link results grid, then it'll just show up what, uh, with what you have selected. Um, and what's nice about these tables within InfoWorks is that you can just uh, press Control C and it's ready to be pasted into Excel, um, which is obviously pretty handy in terms of sharing model results and making sense of them. <clears throat> so now that we've kind of looked at this dry weather flow event, um, we've added these themes, kind of notice that everything seems to be doing okay for now. We have some areas that are potentially a problem, um, but as you're planning your sanitary system for uh, future, for future events, um, it's useful to create these what if scenarios. Um, and so we'll create something, a what if scenario and see what would happen if we were to increase the population of this subcatchment um, in terms of adding a new development at the upstream end of this Queen Street branch. And so when adding um, a new development, there's a lot of different ways you could go about it. If you had the line work already for the pipes, you could uh, use the, GI you could import it via GIS, kind of like how they set this one up. Um, we could also edit the address point file that um, Hunter and Ryan were using during the last demonstration. For the purpose of this kind of uh, quick and dirty tutorial, we're just going to increase the population of the subcatchment. Um, but first, we'll create a new scenario. So up here is kind of where you have your scenario options. I'll press Create Scenario, and I'll give it a name of New Development. And I'm just going to add some notes. Uh, increased population for new development. 
I'll press OK. Um, so now I have that scenario built, and I'm just going to double click on the subcatchment uh, so I can edit the subcatchment object properties. I'll increase this population to, let's just say, 1,000. Um, and that data flagging will indicate that uh, MP, Midori Patterson, made these changes, which can help you um, keep track of, of these changes. And um, yeah, that data flagging is, is pretty useful. So now that I've added that, um, <clears throat> we'll go ahead and create a new run. Well, actually, first, commit it to the database. Um, always good to keep detailed notes. So added new development, increased population. That's OK. It's going to ask to validate it, um, check for errors, and that has been committed. So now, now we're going to actually um, create this new run. So we'll press update to latest. We have the base scenario um, and our new development scenario. I'm just going to go ahead and run both um, and press run change simulations. Press start. Um, and in our job control, we'll see how we'll, we can check the progress of those. Um, and so once this is run, we'll add these theme groups. And what's really nice about how ICM kind of stores these theme groups as these separate objects is that you can apply them to different scenario results. You can apply them to different networks. You can even move them like between model groups. Uh, you can see I have these other model groups loaded in here, which are just other ICM projects that I've been working on. Um, and so kind of having them stored separately is um, pretty useful. And something happened here. My dry weather flow model did not run. And I think that's because I have it. Yeah, so the file may be open in the UI. I have it open here. And so that's why it didn't run. So I'll try to edit one more time. With nothing open. Yep, I'll just run the incomplete ones, which is just that dry weather flow that I accidentally had open. Well, I tried to run it, and then we'll start to compare these. Um, compare the new development versus the base scenario. So I will just drag that into the geo plan or into the ICM um, window here. Again, drag these themes on. Um, you can kind of click through to see how, what's going on here. Or again, we'll just show Maxima. Um, and you can see that with this increased population, we are having some pipes surcharging on flow. Um, and if we look at the node freeboard, again, um, we're also experiencing some flooding here. And kind of just to verify that, um, in the Queen Street branch, we'll drag the selection set on and we can take a look at it in the pipe uh, or in the long section view. And the HGL is indeed surpassing those manhole elevations. And so those are areas that we might, or that we're showing that we'll be experiencing some flooding. And it's also important to note that these themes carry over into the long section. So um, these are also, you can see up here, these are also applied, which is useful. And you can also kind of open two different scenario results um, at the same time if you'd like. So you can kind of make this um, visual comparison and just look at the different results um, on this plan view area. And so that's all I really wanted to show. Um, Tim's going to go over, kind of add that rainfall of that event back in. Um, are there, did any questions pop up during that, Tim? Uh, no questions, actually, Good. surprisingly. But um, yeah. one question I had for you, and not to put you on the spot at all, but I think <laughs> I, I think it's uh, an important point. How did the population kind of get related back to the the wastewater flow? That the kind of connection there. Uh, could, could you show show how that wastewater group kind of connects to the uh, yes. population where that's set up? 
I, I don't sure. remember if Ryan and Hunter covered that last week, but I think it's an important point. Yeah, so in this wastewater group is where we have um, those objects. And if you open them, um, this is the domestic waste profile editor. And, oops, I forget how this was loaded, but um, this is kind of just the data. And then if you go to this profile tab here, you can see that this is just like a factor based on population or based on the time. And then this is applied to the population and that is how it calculates those demands. Yeah. Does that so, answer your question? Yeah, so it's just a little bit different in ICM um, compared to some SWIM models, I think for some folks, but on that, first tab there you've got average kind of waste flow per capita flow that you specify so that's 17 cubic feet per day in that in that particular um wastewater flow curve so that's that connects then to your population for your sub catchment that dictates how much kind of overall wastewater flow is coming from each area so when you increase the population to a thousand there obviously that uh flow for that sub catchment went up and then again that profile you can kind of set the patterns, that diurnal curve for your wastewater flow within each of those as well. So um, awesome, yeah. Okay, great. Well, I'll start sharing my screen and just keep going off of that, um, off of kind of where Midori left off and we will look at, okay, now we've looked at dry weather flow. What about adding a particular rainfall event? If we've got issues under dry weather flow conditions with this new potential development, maybe that, you know, thousand people moving in, that's an apartment building or a, a yeah, huge apartment building, I guess. But uh, we'll go ahead and share my screen and pick up where you left off there. Uh, Abdul, you asked a question. Can you add flow instead of population? If you add population, uh, where do you add? So you add the population. Again, the population is added at the uh, subcatchment level. So each of these kind of polygons you see here, uh, you see the arrow that kind of points them to a particular node here. Um, once this opens up here for me, uh, you can see each subcatchment is directed to a particular node. So you can add kind of a there are other ways you can just add direct flow instead of uh, looking at population. I think those are kind of the trade flow options. And um, there, there is another kind of object you can add if you just want to add direct flow and, and directly kind of manipulate that and not uh, mess with the, the population data of a subcatchment. Uh, there are options for that. But again, the way we were doing it here is... Um, is with the population. So right now this subcatchment has zero population in my particular model. Um, yeah, and so if you just want to add flow, uh, it could go in another cap category here. Here's your other inflows. You just start adding that as cubic feet. Okay. And then add a, a separate profile. If that doesn't follow the standard diurnal curve, I think these would be your options here. All right, I think, I think hopefully that answers your question, Abdul. Again, it's at the subcatchment level, and then that subcatchment is assigned to flow into a particular node within your, your network here. So uh, all of that flow comes in at, at this node here. Uh, so yeah, that, that node, uh, I mean, it depends. Sometimes it's the upstream node, sometimes it's the downstream node. I mean, for this pipe reach, it's the downstream node of this pipe. For this, it's the you know upstream end, uh, but it's the upstream end for this pipe if we're looking at this link here. Okay. All right. Uh, so again, with that, I'll start looking at um, again what happens with uh, again we've looked at dry weather flow, but what about again adding a rainfall event? I think Ryan at the end of last week added a, a huge 19-inch rainfall event. Might not have been. Uh, too uh, realistic, but we'll look at maybe a slightly more realistic um, option in here today with this model. So uh, I'm going to turn off that background there for a bit. 
and we'll start looking at that same reach now. So uh, we, we've kind of gone through these wastewater objects, and again, we'll start to look at rainfall events here. So uh, same reach we'll be looking at. Uh, Queen Street, very suspect for potential SSOs and RDII flow in here. Uh, and there are a couple different ways uh, to um, create uh, different rainfall events. You can simply create uh, kind of custom rainfall events where you're basically just importing from a CSV and you're saying, this is my time, this is my uh, inches per hour here. Or we do have some uh, ways to kind of create a rainfall event uh, for your network based on uh, particular standards. So I just checked that design rainfall event. We've got tons of different um, worldwide standards in here. I think one of the more common ones in the US is this these SCS design rainfall events. So that's what I've chosen to do here today. And you can see within uh, this rainfall event uh, generator, I left all these parameters up here because this is a short enough event, six hours. I'm not gonna worry too much about changing any of those defaults, uh, but I made this uh, intensity pattern type two for, you can change that. Uh, before you start using this uh, rain event generator. Uh, once you use this rainfall event generator, it does become read only. So it says that up here, you can't edit it anymore because it's being used in particular simulations. Uh, but I changed this to type two, so that would fit over you know, some part of the US. I think quite a bit of the US is type two there. Uh, again, duration six hours instead of 24. And then uh, for, for some reason, I still have yet to figure this out. We, it rounded my one inch to 0.999999, um, but uh, this is one inch kind of rainfall event. I you know, made it up as a 25 year event, um, but, but that's all for adding, uh, again, a simple kind of design rainfall event for my, um, for my network here. All right, so I gotta delete that one I don't need anymore. Uh, but again, we're going to start looking at uh, how this operates uh, in that wet weather event. So looking at just the results from that rainfall event, I, I've pre-run this already. I, I could rerun it and be brave like Midori was, and she handled that error quite nicely. But I've gone ahead and kind of pre-run uh, my events here. Um, so if we look at, <clears throat> again, this result uh, where I did run this rain event, all I did again was just, there's like Midori was saying, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of options that you can add within Inforex ICM, but uh, I just added uh, my one rainfall event here. I, I did in the past look at earlier, I was looking at, okay, what if this was you know one and a half inch, two inches, you could do multiple rain events all within the same run. Um, but I, I just simplified on the one here. Uh, I added a start time because uh, I don't know, I was feeling fancy, but you don't even need to add a start time in here. If you wanted to add just zero, zero, zero and have your uh, time kind of pick up from where, um, well, I didn't want that, uh, where you kind of left off um, or, or just time zero, uh, you, can, you can do that as well, all right? Um, so just how this was made here. Again, I've got the kind of time bar in the top left here tells me I'm within a read-only simulation. Uh, if I move this around within my similar themes that uh, Midori was showing, I'm seeing that I do have, uh, it looks like maybe some surcharging here. And if I bring it to max, I can definitely see uh, that it looks like I've got some surcharging happening on this network. I can look at that long section just as Midori was doing. And, and again, you don't, you, you'd see more details. If you had a 2D simulation, I might be able to see on my mesh, where is this water actually ponding once it's, you know, coming out of this manhole here, but you don't need a full, you know, 2D simulation to know that you're, you might have a problem. I guess if it's going over your manhole, uh, you might have a problem there, right? So uh, again, like Midori was showing, can see that, um, theme on uh, on my long section as well. See those orange dots and can quickly kind of zoom in and see, you know, how many uh, kind of flow dip, what's the feet I might be off here. All right. So we'll look to uh, kind of resolve this issue. If I look at that long section, if I hit control and I go to um, those links to, to look at their parameters, uh, oh, not the right table there. Um,
Oh, I didn't have anything selected. That's my problem. There we go. All right, so here, here's that Queen Street again, that reach. I'm gonna notice that, wow, it's only uh, a six inch pipe there. Maybe this is something that needs to be upsized to deal with this added capacity, either from the massive apartment building we're adding with a thousand people or uh, this 25 year event. Uh, we don't want water coming out of our manholes here. So uh, if I look back at my network, you know, I might wanna see, okay, what's the pipe uh, that we're running into here, kind of feeding into? Uh, we're feeding into a pipe that is 21 inches, uh, so 21 inches. So there's certainly uh, justification to make this particular section bigger. Uh, you can even see from the long section profile, you know, just how, uh, you know, this is representing these widths kind of exactly here. So you, when I, when I do some different scenarios here, you'll see those um, get larger here. So I determined that maybe I need to upsize this particular pipe, maybe in this case. Uh, and there's, there's some neat ways to be able to do this. Um, one of the cool things about all the themes and a lot of the tools Midori and I have been showing, queries, uh, selection list groups, runs, is they can be transfer transferable from network to network. So right now I'm just looking at our little demo model for today's webinar, but within you know, my whole master database within Forks ICM, I have all these different models. And, um, you know, some of the tools that were useful for one model can easily be applied to another. So in one of those models, there was this SQL query that what it does is, um, uh, you know, I, I, I can, it makes it easy to piggyback off of someone's work, I guess, and use, you know, what worked for one project or, or one model uh, useful for another. So what this SQL query is gonna do is it's gonna create uh, or I'd already did, again, I, I re-ran everything, but uh, it's gonna create um, different scenarios within my network to say, okay, what if we made that pipe section, uh, that Queen Street kind of branch we've been investigating, uh, eight inches, 10 inches, 12 inches, 16 inches, and you can change that here, uh, you know, automatically. So you don't have to manually create those different scenarios and look at them. You can, I simply just dragged this, uh, SQL query onto my base network there. And it um, went ahead and uh, generated those different scenarios. So uh, if I look at my base network here, I can see I've got size eight, size 10, size 12, size 16. And if I go to those, uh, I can see I've got that that width has changed and it's even got my, again, uh, name on it saying that I changed it. I made this new scenario. Uh, I changed that width. And this is kind of a, a what if for kind of pre-design, right? Will some of these work? And, and can we balance out, you know, we, the larger the size pipe we have to create, the more expensive that uh, upsizing is going to be. Is there some sweet spot where we can hit um, to minimize, uh, you know, overflows, capacity issues, but uh, also minimizing costs. So I, again, uh, went ahead and cheat a little bit. I ran my scenarios. You can see they're in my run group here. Uh, I ran them all within a, a single simulation. You can run all your different kind of branch networks, branch scenarios within a network in, in one simulation here. Um, and, and I had all these results kind of pop up automatically here. Um, but again, if I want to compare these really quickly, one uh, cool tool again within Infworks ICM is this uh, dashboarding tool. So what I just double clicked here is, is kind of a save dashboard where I opened up uh, the different results from uh, my long sections of, of Queen Street. So I could compare these, um, you know, and bring these up very easily for presentations or, or anything like that. Uh, so here are the different uh, long sections based on those different scenarios. So I can see uh, bottom left here, here's my eight inch scenario, here's 10 inches, here's 12 inches, and then here's 16 inches. And I have the surcharging theme linked to the networks for um, this view as well. So, and again, these those workspaces very easy to kind of create. I simply, once you have the view you want, uh, you can simply say new info works and, and then just create that workspace. And then you always have that saved view available that you can recall at any point. Um, but I can quickly kind of see when I'm comparing these, 
Uh, look, uh, scenario size eight, that doesn't look like it worked. I've still got just a little bit of surcharging here at manhole 1073. Um, what about, you know, size 10, uh, size 16, size 12. If you look at the theme at the top, uh, there's, there's really no change in terms of uh, surcharging. There's, it gets pretty close again at that manhole 1073, but in none of the scenarios is it um, overflowing there. So if I wanted to, again, minimize kind of cost excavation work, I might go with this 10 inch uh, scenario in particular here. And again, there, there are lots of different ways uh, that we could uh, look at this. So say maybe I'm thinking, all right, 10 inches looks pretty good. Uh, I saved this, uh, again, kind of custom report that Midori was showing earlier as well, uh, I think. And, and here you can easily just drag and drop those simulations uh, that you want to compare. So I determined, you know, eight inches wasn't good. So 10, 12, 16, Queen Street. I can look at that, you know, surcharge state, the downstream depth uh, within my models. And I can see that you know, maybe it's not um, surcharging in any kind of meaningful way for that 10 inches. It's only kind of backing up. It's not, again, Midori was talking about the difference between kind of flow surcharging and just kind of water backing up into that pipe. Uh, maybe this isn't surcharging. If I do 10 inches to uh, be that significant of a problem, but if I can avoid it altogether by just going up to the 12 inches and and having a D over D value that's always less than one, if in this 25 year uh, event kind of scenario, uh, I can easily uh, do that as well. So maybe, you know, by taking a closer look, I maybe look at um, this 12 inch uh, scenario as, as my option moving forward here. Um, all right. So that is just a little bit in terms of the basics of, of Inforx ICM and some meaningful, I guess, very simple, easy to, to, to get to kind of model results uh, within the network. You know, with this, uh, I think we've walked through everything from model creation to, again, meaningful uh, model results that you can then push out into, um, you know, Excel and using a Power BI report or using a dashboard here um, in a number of, of, of great ways here. So, um, and even if we've got SQL queries for if you wanted to simplify uh, your results even further and just say, you know, it's great that that link, those links and those graphs can show me all this different data for all these different fields. But what if I really just want to know, um, you know, what's, what's the, the, the few fields I really care about here. So, you know, this is an example of, um, again, if I were to select that group and specifically just call the fields I might be interested in, you know, what's the pipe ID, depth, V over D value, uh, what would be the full flow capacity uh, if it was actually um, surcharging based on the flow, uh, that's that full flow capacity that's calculated just based on the diameter and kind of slope on that pipe. Um, you know, are the, the, the upstream or downstream nodes flooding there? Um, and all these things um, can be uh, kind of customized and brought into even a SQL query so you could copy and paste this out wherever you need it to be while still maintaining Inforx ICM as this main kind of uh, storage hub for your modeling, for your gravity flow modeling. Um, we certainly have a number of folks uh, kind of using Inforx ICM just for the database component and the data integrity uh, component of different models that they might be working with and, and ECRAS and EPA SWIM and other things, but then it all kind of come back, comes back to um, Inforx ICM. I see a couple questions in there about uh, RDII flow. Uh, Michael, I think we might have to circle back with you if you're having kind of model specific issues here. Um, but Samir, you had a question about that RTTK modeling for I and I did not discuss that yet. Um, but absolutely, you can plug that in here. This model um, is actually getting some of the runoff just from the, the land development characteristics. But um, that RDII, those, those parameters can absolutely be added at the sub catchment level here. Um, 
So here's my RTK uh, hydrograph here. It's assigned at that subcatchment level. And I, you can see I have those different parameters for uh, RTK, short term, medium term, long term, um, long term all uh, assigned at that subcatchment level. But yeah, if you have kind of further questions, uh, since we're coming to the end here on that RTK modeling, um, you can certainly email those to support at innovize.com. I think that email address still works, pretty sure. Um, that email address still works. And, and otherwise you can always support, submit a case on our support portal as well. But uh, got a whole group of engineers here in the US ready to respond, anything like that. We had one more question coming in about the uh, pipe sizing SQL query that you used. Um, from Abdul, you mentioned, or you said you created four run groups for eight, 10, 12, and 16 inch scenarios. Don't you need to create four different network files for each scenario? Yeah, no, that's kind of the nice thing. Uh, everything still gets stored at the network level so that the network is really where uh, all your kind of input data is stored for your hydraulic models. That's, um, yeah, all the, all the physical characteristics of the model are stored here. And then you can branch off different scenarios from that kind of base um, network, I guess, uh, to, to then modify, you know, uh, kind of those one-offs. So in this case, my one-offs, my different scenarios were the sizing, the capacity of that uh, particular reach there. Uh, so didn't need to create separate networks, all just scenarios within that same network there. I guess you could, if you wanted to, I could, I could copy and paste this network um, just as easily as well, and then and then use it, you know, mix and match the networks within my run events. Um, but you don't necessarily need to if you know you're working with a particular basin, you're going to work with that particular basin or, or that network for um, all the time when you're at that utility or something like that. You don't need to create separate networks. Um, yeah. And then we did have another question um, kind of just about organization. Um, and so it is, how do you group your runs, rainfall events, et cetera, into those respective folders in the master database? Yeah, Midori, did you want to take that one? You were asking about sure. that as we were creating this. Yeah, um, I can share again, I think. So um, I had that question kind of as well, but basically these waste, like the theme group, the wastewater group, SQL queries group, they're just created by um, creating a new InfoWorks. It starts as just a model group. Um, so let's say I wanted to make another, um, make another, um, I kind of have things here, but let's say I just wanted to make a different selection list group they're basically just, uh, they kind of become these groups once you start to add uh, items of the same type. So if I um, select these and copy them and then move them into this selection group, um, I can either just paste them or I can actually uh, move them. Then it kind of, the icon changes and it becomes, it knows that this only has selection lists in it. So it becomes a selection list. Um, so that's kind of how, how, how those work. Yeah, the model group kind of just adapts to what's in it. So that model group doesn't just have to be for inside the model group is where your networks go. The model groups can be used for grouping any kind of things, um, any kind of those objects when you right click in the, in the master database um, objects explorer portal uh, within Inforx ICM. So, I, it was something that took me a little bit actually to understand as well. It's like, oh, Inforx ICM is a little bit like Windows Explorer in that you can have folders within folders and, and it really can be a great way to store these things, um, models in different objects that help you evaluate and uh, look at um, your different models. So um, yeah, super, uh, super useful there and a great way to organize your database. I think that's 
about all the time we've got here. Again, appreciate all the questions from everybody. I, had, I just got confirmation from um, Bob Dickinson, part of our support staff, that the uh, support at innovize.com email definitely does still work. So if you have follow-up questions, uh, please put it in the survey at the end or email support at innovize.com. Uh, happy to dig into all things uh, ICM. There's a lot within the tool, certainly a lot we did not get to uh, for folks today, but hopefully for especially those beginners just getting into Infox ICM, the last two sessions here have been uh, helpful for you all. All right. Thanks, Midori, and uh, have a great week, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Take care.